Hey guys, welcome to Fika with Rice, a podcast about life hacks, inspirational life stories, routines, and keys to success. I'm Frederick Van Hoon, and let's get this Fika started. Welcome to episode two by Fika with Rice. In this episode, I meet Eric Bergman, the Swedish super entrepreneur who's the co-founder of Katina Media, where he went from zero to over 300 employees in five years. Eric made over $50 million before he turned 30, a dream for many people, but at what cost? He now runs Great.com where he gives away 100% of his profits to save the climate. In this episode we'll hear about Eric's life philosophy, his routines, keys to success, but also his best tips to people on finding clarity in your life and how to achieve real happiness in life. This is his story. Let's go. All right. Hello, Eric. Welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, you're one of the most successful Swedish entrepreneurs out there and a living legend. And uh, <laughs> it's really cool that you're also uh, not too far from the town or the li- village where I'm, I was growing up back in Sweden. So thank you for being here with me uh, and our listeners. I thought to kickstart this by asking you, um, how was your brother? And what influence did he have on you while growing up? Can you tell us a little bit more about him? How was my brother? That's a good question. Um, So my my brother, he's three years older than me. And like most younger brothers, I guess he was my superstar growing up. And I did everything that he did. And I just wanted to do everything that he wanted to do. And early on, he had a lot of like ideas of how to make money and what to do. And it started with probably I was three years old, four years old, and he was six, seven. And he pulled me out to sing to our neighbors like Christmas carols, uh, like standing there in their red little Santa suits looking super cute. And well, I guess I was doing a lot of the singing and he took some of the money. He was my, (laughs) my boss in a sense. And I just wanted to do what he did. And then he came up with ideas of how we could make money during all of our childhood, selling bread to our neighbors. We were selling lots and lots of lottery tickets for different sports clubs. And yeah, we, he, was, he was my role model in everything. And I just wanted to be like him. And I, it did went pretty well. So he, he, he's a great guy. Always been, always will be. Okay, it seems that he had a lot of influence on the life choices that you made later on. And and uh, the yeah, success that, that we have in business. I think that up until the age of 16, 17 or something like that, most of my life choices I did was based on the life choices he had made until then. Um, and then somewhere in school, yeah, I started to find my own way and we're, st- we're still very close. Um, but it, now, now we're... I've taken some parts that he has not been doing, but up until then, I was just doing whatever he had done. It was much easier than making up my own mind. I see. You're a very disciplined guy, Eric. And what did your mother or your father teach you about discipline? So one thing that I was told when I was a kid that I remember vividly was that I was lazy. And... I, I made that one of my truths. So up until a few years ago, I would consider myself lazy, even though probably no one who has ever been around me would say that I'm lazy. I'm not sure why that just stuck with me. I wouldn't say that my parents are more hardworking than any other parents. They're pretty normal Swedish parents doing pretty normal things. And I don't think they ever pushed me that much but somewhere back in my head is very clearly that I was called lazy and I'm sure that has influenced my choices on and off I don't think that I've ever tried to prove them wrong it's not that I've been aiming not to be lazy Um, but I've been very I am very disciplined but a lot of it comes from me wanting to come up with fun ways of doing things that are good for me. So it's, it's easy to be disciplined if you enjoy what you do. It's really hard to be disciplined if you don't enjoy what you do. So when it comes to 
to business or exercising or eating healthy food, I'm always looking for ways to do that that I enjoy because then it's easy to do it. If you try lots of different healthy foods and you find out this, this, and this, I really like eating, then it's pretty easy to be healthy. And if you try lots of different ways of doing sports and you find these sports I really love doing, it's pretty easy to keep the routine. But if you don't and you just eat salad and you hate salad, you're probably going back to McDonald's. And if you just go to the gym and you don't like going to the gym, you're probably not going to keep going because it takes too much force and too much discipline. So I'm not sure if I am that, I, I am very disciplined, but I, but I make it easy to be disciplined. Do you have any small tricks, so to speak, or mind games that you play with yourself, Eric, when it comes to, to discipline? I think that mindset of how can I make it easy? And I keep looking for ways to make it easy. And if I don't, either I put that, if, if it's something that takes too much force for me, then I realize I will not be able to do this for the next 50 years. I'm not going to be able to discipline myself to do this for the next 50 years. And that's kind of the mindset that I have. If I can't do this for 50 years, I need to come up with, an, come up with another way of doing this that I would be able to do for 50 years. So my life hack in a sense is that I keep trying ways of doing things until I find a way that I enjoy. And when I stop enjoying it, I don't try to force myself to keep doing it. Instead, I try to find a new way of doing it that I enjoy. So it's, it always goes down to this. It's like, how can I enjoy this? Because if I don't, it's just a matter of time before I give up. And I don't like being in that situation. That's a great way to, to apply it. Regarding your childhood, but while you grew up, um, Eric, what did you think you were going to do when you grew up per se and at, at that point? Or, or what did you want to become when you were younger? If you asked seven, eight, nine-year-old Eric what he wanted to do, he wanted to be a professional football player. But I guess that was because that was the answer that everyone gave. And then if you asked 13-year-old Eric or 14, 15-year-old Eric, he wanted to be a lawyer but he didn't want to be a lawyer. He wanted to make a lot of money. Uh, he just knew that lawyers made a lot of money and he didn't know much about the occupation as such. I don't think that I've ever given the future much thought, like this is what I want to become or this is what I want to do. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never wanted to run businesses. That just happened from me following the path of what feels enjoyable to me. And testing things and doing things that I still don't think that much about what do I want to do in the future. I'm very focused on how can I enjoy today and how can today make me better tomorrow. And even if that's just by 1% better at something tomorrow and continuously doing that, then that will take me to wherever I want to be. Have that always been the mindset of yours, Eric, to always think that, well, if I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now, I should just continue doing that and I'll become a little bit better tomorrow. So I, I think that's been the mindset, but I haven't been aware of it. So if you would have asked 18 year old Eric what his mindset was, I don't think he would have been able to answer it. But looking back with 32 year old Eric, looking at what 18 year old Eric were doing, then I can say that that's pretty much what he was doing. So I, 18 year old Eric just wanted to try things. He loved playing poker, so he played a lot of poker. He wanted to arrange a party because that felt like a good idea. So he rented a nightclub and he completely failed at that. Uh, and then he went on and did other things. I don't think that he gave the future much thought. He just came up with an idea and then he tried to make it happen. And most of the time he completely failed. Um, but he learned from it and kept going. You touched on, on poker, which is really interesting. I mean, you were a professional poker player online and at a very young age. Um, when you were making all this money and being so successful in, on online poker, what did you visualize? What were your dreams when you were playing poker? I loved the game. From the first time I started playing poker, I didn't want to do anything else than playing poker. 
And I used to love board games and stuff like that as a kid as well. And we always played a lot of card games in my, with my parents and family. So I've always loved games. I loved Monopoly and I loved chess. I loved all kinds of games. So when I first started playing poker, it wasn't about the money. It was about the game. I love the game. And for four or five years there, that was pretty much everything I was thinking about. That and yeah, girls. I mean, I was a teenage boy at the end of the day. <laughs> Definitely girls. Uh, but I didn't think that much ahead for the future. I was just busy enjoying the game and trying to be as good as possible at the game. What did poker teach you about life, Eric? Oh, that's a good question. So poker, poker taught me a lot about life. Um, one thing that poker taught me is to deal with failure. I mean, if you're playing poker, you're winning and losing hundreds of times per day. And sometimes you're losing even though you make the right decision because it's to a large extent the game of luck. So you can lose for long periods of time even though you're making the right decisions. And it teaches you to deal with failure uh, in a way. It, it makes you mentally strong. Um, unfortunately, it can also teach you to shut off. And it's easy to end up shutting off your emotions instead of dealing with your emotions. And that's something that can be tricky to deal with later on. And I think to some extent I did that. Um, but also teach you the importance of making decisions. I, I think that something that really hurts people is the inability to make a decision that we're sitting in front of should i go to school or should i start working and the it's probably both decisions are more or less equally good so we struggle to make a decision because we believe that this is such an important decision and we might postpone the decision for another year because we don't know which decision to make so we end up pushing the decisions into the future and often making no decision is the worst thing you can do because you could probably start school and if you didn't like it, you could have quit or you could have started working and if you wanted to go to school, you could have quit your work. But instead you stayed at whatever the thing you were doing instead of moving on with your future. And in poker, you have 30 seconds to make a decision and you make decisions hundreds of thousands of times uh, playing poker. So it taught me to make decisions quickly. And it taught me that almost all decisions are better than no decisions. And I've applied that in, in most areas of life. That's um, a really, really interesting metaphor and some really, really good lessons, uh, gold coins um, right there, Eric. I know a lot of people are listening right now. I mean, they're considering um, to potentially invest in a master's degree, some are considering to, to change a job or some are, are looking to perhaps start their own company. And I think that wisdom regarding decision-making could really help them. You made a lot of money before you turned 30, Eric. You made, um, I mean, you can't trust everything that you read on the internet, but you made over 50 million US dollars before you turned 30. Uh, what did that teach you about success? That is requires a lot of luck. Uh, so when so I started companies early on and I failed at most of them and I did a lot of them together with my childhood friend, Emil. He was a computer genius and I was business savvy. But the first six attempts or something, we had horrible business ideas that didn't work out. And uh, the, the first five and the sixth one became a huge success that we took to the stock exchange. And if any of the first five would have gone a little bit better. Th those wouldn't have been so bad and we wouldn't have been so bad. I would have been stuck with a business idea that actually wasn't that good and I would never have made $50 million before 30. So it's, I think it's crucial to understand that that kind of success doesn't come to anyone without a large portion of luck. And I got really lucky. I mean, I, I did a really good job. I was disciplined. I was smart. I worked hard. But if I would have been working on any of the first business ideas, if they would have been good enough to kind of work, I would never have kind of stumbled on the gold mine that became the business that I'm actually building. So I think a crucial part that I learned about business is 
anyone who is a huge success, anyone who is hugely famous for what they've done, have been lucky. They worked hard, but a hundred other people worked equally hard and were probably equally smart, but didn't have the same level of luck that didn't take them to the absolute extreme heights. How did making so much money affect the lens through which you view the world? That's an interesting question. So I grew up in a very regular Swedish family. I had what I needed. I, my family was super loving, super supportive, amazing at, in every way. But from a financial perspective, we were very regular. And most, I went to like a rich and fancy school and I wasn't rich and fancy, but most of my friends were rich and fancy. So I always felt inferior to them. It always felt like they were better than me because they had all of these expensive things. They had these big, nice houses. They had the new cars and stuff like that. So I always wanted money and I always felt that once I get money, I will be happy. I will kind of feel fulfilled. And at age 28, we took our company to the stock exchange and I made a lot of money. Uh, And that joy that came with that didn't last very long. I mean, I was super happy that day and for a few weeks, but then things kind of went back to normal. I was sick. I had problems with my girlfriend. I had neglected my health. A lot of things wasn't amazing. And money definitely creates happiness to some extent because it takes a lot of problems away, but it doesn't create fulfillment and it doesn't give you endless joy or anything like that. You're still going to struggle with your relationships, with yourself, with all kinds of issues. So knowing that up until I was 28, I kind of thought that as long as I get more money, I will be happier. And now I know that it's not going to take me the full way by any means and money doesn't equal happiness. It can help. It can solve all your money problems. And if you're worried about rent or if you have an annoying boss or some things like that, it can definitely make a big impact. But having the car or the house or the business class traveling is not what's going to make a big difference. And I realized that early on, which I'm very thankful for. What's the, the price for success, you would say, Eric? You were, you were touching a little bit on that, that you had issues with your girlfriend. Uh, issues with your personal health? So the part of entrepreneurship that is rarely spoken about is the sacrifices that usually come with it. I mean, when I was at the peak of my business journey, what people saw was that we have gotten, we built a, a company in three and a half years that got valued at $200 million on the stock exchange And me and Emil, uh, the other founder, uh, it was on our, we're born on the same day in the same hospital by parents who knew each other. So we've been around for for a while. And it was our 28th birthday when we took it to the stock exchange. And that was what everyone saw. What, What was going on behind the scenes was that I had a bottle of whiskey next to my bed because I couldn't fall asleep unless I had whiskey because my mind was spinning endlessly. My relationship with my girlfriend was not in a good place. Our sex life was crap. I was neglecting my health. I could barely talk about work outside of the office. So if someone asks me about what's going on with the company, it's like, I could barely hold back my tears because I was so drained of energy. And it was all me. I had pushed myself to this. It was me who wanted to get to this point that quickly. It wasn't anyone else, but none of these, none of these things is what you see if you read about a successful entrepreneur. But anyone who takes a company from zero to huge in a few years has made a lot of sacrifices. They've been very lucky and they made a lot of sacrifices. And to be honest, I don't think it's worth it to do it at that pace. It's not something to kind of aim for. I would much rather been successful in 10 years than in three years, but made it in a way that it was healthy to do it. And I think it's crucial to enjoy the ride rather than than pushing for, I mean, what, what happened was also like, let's say I, was, I would have gotten severely sick or 
one of my family members would have gotten sick or something like that. Like, so my mother would have gotten cancer. I don't think that I would have been able to deal with that. So I would probably have crashed totally. And at that stage, the company would have crashed if it wasn't for me. So it was also me taking way too high risks that wasn't sustainable. And it was only luck that none of those things happened. I mean, I wasn't in charge that the, my mother didn't get cancer. If that would have happened, I would probably have crashed. So I, I like to look at my business journey as running down a steep hill. Like imagine running down a ski slope during summer. So it's just grass. And you're running, but you don't have control. So you can't actually stop. But as long as you manage to stay on your feet, you're okay. But if you fall, you're going to crash and you're going to crash badly. And I think to a large extent, that was me at this time. I was running. I was running really, really fast, but I was running downhill without control. And it was just luck that I didn't stumble on something. If you're running down a ski slope in the summer, I mean, you're not going to you're not going to be skilled not to fall. You're going to be lucky if you don't fall. And that was happened to me. So this is, once again, what I'm referring to when I'm saying that most entrepreneurs have been lucky because you're not going to see the ones who fell when they ran down the hill. Those stories are not going to end up in Forbes. You only see the ones who manage to keep on their feet. And there's always one, someone who's going to be able to stay on their feet. That's... Um... Really interesting metaphor as well, Eric, and thank you for, for sharing um, the hidden sacrifices and uh, the prices that I'm sure a lot of the young listeners, they don't, they don't really see when they're seeing the Ferraris, the, the expensive watches, the, the expensive travels on Instagram and on social media. I don't think they, uh, they can see the, the real price that people are paying. Um, they were talking about the, the whiskey bottle next to your bed, um, and that helped you go to sleep, you know, before you made it, um, Eric, and before you sold your company, um, what did you tell yourself every day to keep going? You're asking a lot of interesting questions. I haven't given much thought before. <laughs> what did I tell myself? I think at the end of it. I, I, I was telling myself just until the IPO, so just until we took it to the stock exchange, because we kind of had a firm deadline that, okay, that's where I'm going. As long as I can go towards that date, I'll be okay, because I was not in good shape. And I had this whiteboard on my, uh, in my living room where I was counting down the days towards this. Was it just go there? And then we missed the deadlines. We needed to, I needed to start over counting down the days. And we missed the deadline again. And I needed to start over and add another 90 days or something. So for me, at that time, when I was pushing the most, it was just like, I can't imagine what it is like to run a marathon and you're getting really tired and you just keep telling yourself, just one more mile, just one more mile, and then one more mile. And you kind of, you can't focus too far into the future. You can just maybe just one more step, one more step, one more step. And I think that's where I were. And I wouldn't encourage anyone to put themselves in a situation like that. Like if, if that's where you are with your mindset, if that's, I think it's much healthier to just say, okay, let's slow down. Let's be fine with this taking a lot longer than anticipated because I'm taking too much risk right now and I'm risking things that I'm not willing to lose, like my health and my relationships. It's never worth losing your health for business. Still, it's very easy to put you in, yourself in that situation. And I put myself in that situation. And once again, it was luck. It wasn't skill that made it happen. Um, so I think that that's, that was the mindset I had. And I don't think it was a healthy one. Um, Eric, I'm meeting a lot of young people um, that are envisioning fancy clothes, Louis Vuitton bags, Prada bags, Rolex watches you name it, as success. What would you tell them? So I believe that I used to want all of those things. I used to see success as the watch you had. And today I'm very, very proud to be wearing a 
hundred dollar Fitbit watch that just keeps my pulse and monitors my sleep, even though I can afford any watch I want. To me, having an expensive watch would just be a, like a bracelet of insecurity around my wrist. Like if I need to show it on my wrist, I don't feel it in my heart. So for me, I'm 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 impressed by the fancy people that don't have fancy clothes. Like I'm impressed of seeing Mark Zuckerberg in a black t-shirt or Bill Gates in like sweatpants. Uh, to me, that's it says more about the security that comes from within. It's like the, the really powerful people don't need those things. And that's what impresses me. Like people who don't need a brand to know that they're valued or to know what they can accomplish. So I think I read this quote uh, some, some time ago. Where it's like, I used to be impressed by people in suits until I realized that they work for the guy who can wear the sweatpants. And it's like, I think that's powerful with tech companies and stuff like that. Like the guy with the suits, they're not the, mo- they're not the top of the pyramid. The guy in the sweatpants is the guy in the top of the pyramid. Um, so I think to just zoom out and be able to realize that, that there is something beyond the watches, like you can aim for something much bigger but it's less visual. And the people who don't need the visual are the people who have things figured out. The people who need the visual don't have it as figured out as the people who don't need it. Hey, Rick, you worked very hard. Um, I mean, since you were young, you know, on, on the things that you really enjoyed. Did you have any mentors while growing up, Eric? So I believe that it's amazing to have a mentor if you have a mentor, but I think something that is even more important is to have friends that are like mentors. And I've never had one mentor that is like 10, 20, 30 years older than me that inspires me, but I've been good at finding friends that inspires me. So my, my closest friends are my mentors in various areas and I truly admire them for their skills. So I have friends that are amazing public speakers that I learn so much about. I have friends that are amazing at structuring their learning. So like the nerds at studying how to automize things. And I learn from them. I have a girlfriend who is amazing at everything that has to do with love and understanding what love is. She's my mentor in, in that area. So you have lots of mentors and no mentor in a sense. And I think what's crucial here is to understand that if you want to get somewhere, I think the crucial part is to find friends that either are there already or wants to get to the same place. And this is not spoken about enough, if you ask me. Like, It's common to say that you, need, you, you become the average of your five most, the five friends you spend the most time with. That's like a common thing that people say but it's rarely spoken about how to change it or what to do about it. And for me, I think it's crucial to start looking at friends who want to get to the same destination. And usually we end up with friends. They're our neighbors. They play in our football team. They go in our class. We work together. We become friends because we're kind of close to each other physically, but not because we're close to each other's on a dream or goal or vision level. So I think, Something that is amazing with social media today is that you can find a mentor. You can start following any Instagram account of someone famous. And if you like what they do, everyone who follows that person also like what they do, which means that you're probably very similar to the people following that person. And you're probably on a similar journey as someone following that person. So if you start following Tim Ferriss on Instagram. Everyone who follows Tim Ferriss on Instagram probably listens to his podcast. So everyone probably likes life hacks. They like small business ideas. They like these kinds of things. And everyone who comments on his posts like these things. So if you start writing messages to the people in his comments, like, hey, I really like what you comment here. I really like what you did here. Then you're reaching out to someone who is already on the same life path journey as you are, probably have the same goals and same interests. And there are hundreds of thousands of those people out there. 
and they will just follow the same people that you follow. So it makes it easy to kind of create your own mentorship circle then. And I think it's much more important that your friends want to get places than that you have one mentor because friends you can spend hours with every day. A mentor, at best, you spend a lunch with them once a week and probably more like once a quarter or once a year. Maybe a phone call here and there, but friends, you can hang out with them 24-7. And that's what's going to get you further. Maybe one hour with that mentor is worth more than one hour with a friend. That, But probably 20 hours with your friends, if they want to get to the same place, is worth a lot more than one hour with a mentor. What's a good friend to you, Eric? Uh, is someone who is good at listening and doesn't try to fix me. So if I'm sad, they're listening to me being sad and they're not trying to make me feel better in the moment because that's rarely what someone needs. I think that if I'm sad, I need to be sad. And someone who feels safe enough to let me be sad because a lot of the time we want to cheer people up. But And we think we want to share people up because we want to do a nice thing. But what we're actually doing is we're saying, your emotions right now are not good. Let's change them. And a lot of the time we change them because we feel better if the person around us is happy than if the person around us is sad because we get uncomfortable with sadness. We get uncomfortable with tears. We get uncomfortable with all kinds of these things. So someone who, if I'm sad, in case of, instead of trying to get me away from sadness, Try to kind of understand my sadness and be there with me rather than change me. Because I think that sadness, for example, is such an, it's an healing experience that the, nature didn't invent sadness for no reason. Like nature didn't invent sleeping for no reason. Why would we ever spend eight hours per day uh, not eating, not creating more babies and not being able to defend ourselves? That's like, Nature didn't put it there if it wasn't super important. So I really don't like the idea of trying to sleep less because nature didn't just give you that for no reason. And I think it's the same with sadness. Like sadness is there for a reason, even if we don't understand it. It's very often like we try to get away from it. We try to change it, but nature wouldn't make us sad if it wasn't important. So I think if I can stay with sadness, for example, and I have friends that are willing to let me be in sadness with them and help me through that rather than change it. I think that's what makes a good friend. That's a very insightful thought, Eric. Um, It's true what you're saying that I'm a very positive person. I'm a very cheerful person. I like to cheer people up. And I think that's a very good insight, something for for myself, but also the listeners as well to keep in mind when you're around close friends, close friends, family members, when it comes to checking their, their current emotional state. Eric, you mentioned social media before and you were mentioning that it's so easy to to find somebody you look up to on Instagram or or Facebook, whatever social media you like and and sort of find inspiration from that. You have been a very private person um, on social media, but also in general. But now we have thousands of followers on Instagram. What changed? I... I believe that Instagram is one of the worst inventions ever made. I think that very few things have had such a bad impact on humanity in general. It's highly addictive and highly based on comparisons. Like you compare your life with someone else and you're comparing your life with someone else's absolute highlight because that's what they put out there. So I think few inventions have created as much misery as Instagram. And that's why I've stayed very far away from it. And that's why I'm not following anyone on Instagram, for example, because I get addicted to it. I get sucked into it. I compare myself to the life I'm seeing, the happiness, the bodies, the everything. So I can't deal with with it from a consumer perspective. And what changed was that I realized that, okay, this is not going away. This is what people are doing. There is crazy amount of people doing this how can I make the best out of a good situation, the best out of a bad situation? And I wanted to explore social media and come up with a way that I enjoyed it and where I felt that I could add value to people. So at first I thought that to make Instagram 
good. I need to make the absolute best content I can come up with. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. And then I realized I don't have to have the best content anywhere. It just needs to be a lot better than the average thing that people are scrolling by. Because if, if I'm a little bit better than the average thing, then I give value to people because they see that instead of some Instagram model on a Photoshopped picture or whatnot. That mindset shift of, okay, I'm actually helping a lot of people. If I'm putting decently valuable content, and I believe it's very valuable a lot of the time, uh, on a platform where I don't really like it in the beginning, I think that's a great thing. It's like, if there's a shop selling cigarettes, I think cigarettes is a horrible thing. But if I can put a smoothie in there so someone can drink smoothies, then at least I do what I can to make it better. So by social media in itself, I think that if you use it in, the, in a good way, if you are very, very picky with who you follow and what you do on social media, then it's tremendously powerful. But I believe it is like going into a store full of cigarettes and there is one smoothie, but everything else is probably bad for you. I think that 99% or something of social media is going to be addictive and probably bad for you. But if you follow only that 1%, which adds value, then social media can change your world in a thousand times and just make it so, so good. You can follow the best people in any field on social media. You can learn from the best for free almost everywhere. But you can also get sucked into Prada bags or bikini models or feeling horrible about yourself and comparing yourself and just finding yourself being miserable and alone. And I'm not strong enough to deal with social media. That's why I'm not following people on Instagram. I get sucked into it. So I doubt that anyone, I mean, it's really, really hard to deal with as well. That's a very mature answer, Eric, and a very mature analysis of social media and Instagram in general. Um, we have a lot of young listeners um, and a lot of them, they, I'm sure they have a big passion for Instagram and they're sort of addicted, you know, to it. What would you tell them? What type of advice would you give to them if you were to speak to them right now? Because I would give them a challenge and that would be to unfollow everyone for a week and see how that feels. Turn off notifications on your phone and see how that feels. And if you don't want to actually unfollow people on Instagram, because that could be somewhat of a statement, go in and like you can hide their pictures in the settings. So hide the pictures on everyone. Make a completely clear feed. You're probably going to pick up your phone a thousand times that week. Uh, and afterwards, if you want to keep follow people, ask yourself with every person you're following, do I get happier watching their pictures? Or do I get jealous or envy or frustrated? Or do I get happier? Do I learn something? Does this make me into a better person? And then only follow accounts that turn you into a better person. And this is hard, but I believe that 99% of the accounts are not going to give you more positive feelings. It's just addictive. It gives you a little hit of dopamine every time you do it. So your kind of reward system says, oh, maybe next, pic next picture is good. Oh, maybe next picture is good. Oh, maybe next picture is good. Oh, shit, I just wasted 45 minutes sitting on the bathroom. Uh, so for me, clean it out and then start from scratch and just follow people that you believe actually make you a better person, that actually turn to, gets you closer to where you want to be. And that's why I'm not following anyone because I, I think it's really, really hard. <laughs> You know, you're right. Social media is a dark place, you know, um, and you need to be mentally strong to to manage that and be emotionally mature about how much of that you could handle, actually. Imagine that you take one billion people and then you take some of the smartest people in the world and you give those smartest people in the world to create the most addictive drug they can come up with. And you can do endless of tests with a billion people every day in real time to see which is the most addictive thing that you can come up with. This is effectively social media. So Facebook has a billion users and Instagram, I don't know, hundreds of millions and that's what they have. And then some of the smartest people in the world today, the programmers sitting there, they test every day, how can we get people to use our product more? 
which is basically how can we make it even more addictive? And if you're fighting against the smartest people in the world trying to make you addictive to something, I mean, it's, it's an uphill battle. You're going to struggle. <laughs> and yeah, I'm not strong enough to deal with it. Eric, of, of all the success you have achieved so far, how do you continue to develop yourself as a human being and as an entrepreneur without falling into the comfort zone? How do you think about that? So I believe that my the most important value that I'm carrying with me in my life, what matters the most to me, is to contribute to the people around me one way or another. I want to add value to others. And there is like an endless way of doing that. There is an endless opportunity of helping others. So that's kind of what keeps me going, that the more, the more I engage myself, the better I become at social media or podcasting or public speaking or whatever it is. The better I get, the more people I can, one way or another, help and improve their lives. So it's, I'm not even close to what I could accomplish in my life in probably 1% of the impact I'm hoping to have. And that keeps me going and keeps me very excited and engaged because it feels very, very meaningful to me to learn more and become better at kinds of any kind of thing to be able to make a bigger impact in the future. And I have a very long-term perspective. I don't think much about what I'm going to do in 2020. For me, it's important. What can I accomplish before 2070, the next 50 years? That's like the perspective I, I have. That's why joy is so important because if i'm going to keep doing this for 50 years i need to have fun otherwise it's not going to matter about learning and about developing yourself you have a very cool note-taking system i know eric <laughs> you love to mind map can you tell us a little bit more about that <laughs> yeah i love my mind maps uh yeah so basically i'm using a software called mindjet mind manager i think uh, it's an expensive one. There are tons of free ones as well. And I like taking notes in, in mind maps. I like doing everything in mind maps. And right now I'm using mind maps most for us for our own podcast, where all the things we're going to talk about in each episode, I do a mind map about. And the brilliant about mind maps compared to other like notes is that it becomes more visual. You can move things around to change the order you want, which is really hard if you've done it in a notebook, for example. So I do this when I, I used to do it a lot when I read books. Right now, I've been a bit too lazy to put it into notes. <laughs> uh, but it's, I, I just love mind maps in general. It makes everything easier. And if you've never worked in mind maps, please just play around with it and see if you love it. Either you love it or you don't. And once again, I believe in testing things to find the most pleasurable way of doing it. And for me, the most enjoyable way of taking notes has been to turn it into mind maps. I love that, uh, Eric. I'm a big mind mapper since age 10, since we learned it back <laughs> in school. Uh, so, but I, I, I do it offline. I take an A4, you know, white paper. Uh, and I just, I put my thoughts there and, you know, a big circle in the middle and that helps me construct my, uh, my thoughts and, and vision. It's true what you're saying. It makes it more visual. Absolutely. Yeah, way better. And it's fun. It's fun to do it by hand as well. You like use your hands. I think that the more senses that you engage when you're trying to learn something, the easier it is to remember. Like if you use your hands, I believe it sticks more in your brain because there are more sensories involved with it. It's true. It's true. I, I'm a big jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu player. I, I train a few times per week and that's something I learned from my professor too. He told me that Sometimes just by watching something, I think I get it. But then when I have to do it my, with my body, I don't. So he asked me to close my eyes uh, and engage my ears and my, my feelings. And sometimes that works much better. Yeah, it's a big difference. Absolutely. Eric, you said that you, you're reading. I know that you were not a big reader before, but that's something that you picked up later, lately. What changed? Yeah, I didn't like reading in school. Uh, I didn't like reading growing up. I'm not sure when it shifted. I think it started with audiobooks. Like audiobooks was easier to consume. It was less, didn't take as much from me. So 
probably started with audiobooks and I started to get value from audiobooks. And then, yeah, I, I just, I've, I've read, I've, I still listen a lot and I read quite a bit. And I think it just realized what an, crazy amount of impact a book can have like the first book that really changed the way i see the world was how to win friends and influence people by dale carnegie it's like written in 1936 but it's super accurate today and it's about how you can turn anyone you meet into a friend or how you can be a great leader or it's like step by step things super easy to apply and just reading this, I realized, oh, holy fuck, I wish I would have known this earlier. It has had an impact in pretty much every area of my life. And just realizing, okay, from spending, I don't know, five, 10 hours reading this book and then applying this to my life, my life got five, 10% better from just reading that book. And that's like crazy how 10 hours of a book can change so many areas of my life. And I think when I know it, now I just keep looking for other books that could have the same kind of impact. And I've read one other book that had more or less as powerful impact called Nonviolent Communication by an author named Marshall Rosenberg. And I would trade all other books that I've read for just those two books. They've been so incredibly helpful for me that the first one is about how can you turn any any person you meet into a friend or someone that likes you and that you like, and how can you get people interested in, in you by being interested in them? But the other book is about how can you turn any one of these interactions into a deep and meaningful relationship? For example, like what I mentioned before, how can you sit with someone in sadness and actually be there? And how does it feel when someone is there with you? And how can you be the one who can be there for someone else? Like, how deep and meaningful relationships form and how you see what other people need. And at the end of the day, everything that we do in our life is about relationships and other people. Nothing would be meaningful if you didn't have other people around. You wouldn't even be able to do jujitsu if it wasn't for other people. So nothing else is equally important to how we interact with others, I would say. So those two books are far more important than anything that I've learned about business or, I don't know, sports or whatever. And it's amazing. It's just by realizing how valuable books can be kind of changed my mindset. Like in school, the books we're forced to read in school, I mean, history or whatnot, it's not really going to change your life much. So unfortunately, most of the books we interact with early in our lives doesn't do anything for us and probably just a struggle. And then it's hard to get away from that mindset of books suck to, wow, books are awesome. I love Dale Carnegie and um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, I would consider that one of the best 10 euros or $10 investment I've ever made. Because like you were saying, it's had a, a massive return on investment, if you want to say it, uh, on the way I treat life and the way I, I've been making new friends, but also um, nurturing the current friends and relationships that I have. Yeah, so. same for me. I wish that if there was one book that I wish that everyone would read in school, it's that book. And I wish they would read them at every grade. <laughs> yes. Eric, um, let's say that I'm very bad at relationships. I'm not very good when my friends are sad or, or etc. What would you, what type of advice would you give me? Because it seems that you are very emotionally mature. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the first thing I would say is, uh, you have two ears and one mouth and you have that for a reason. You're supposed to listen twice as much as you speak. And in most situations, silence and presence is enough. Like if you just sit with someone and you listen to them, that's almost always better than giving them advice or telling them interesting stories or anything else. And sure, if there are situations where speaking is, is preferable, but in general, we speak too much and we listen too little. And once you're listening, try to understand what it is that they are feeling if they're excited try to understand why they're excited if they're sad try to understand why they're sad rather than just trying to 
switch the focus to yourself or change the topic or whatever it is like get people to have their experience and be with them in their experience instead of trying to take their attention into your experience and for most of my life i mean before i read these books and before i started making these adaptations myself i was a very loud person i was talking a lot and i was even referred to as the radio when i was a kid because i was always speaking and it's very hard for someone else to feel valued and important if the only thing I was doing was talking. It's very hard for someone else to feel listened to if I want to shut up. And whenever someone said something, I try to turn it into my story or the classic, like someone tells a story and you want to tell an even better story. So you can like one up them. I was like, oh yeah, I made a hundred bucks. Oh, that's nothing. I made 200 bucks. It's like, or, oh, I was out in the cold. It was minus 20 degrees. Oh, I was out with cold, it was minus 25 degrees. And it's such a typical behavior when we don't listen to listen, we listen to reply. And if you find yourself already having an answer to whatever the other person is saying, and you just wait for them to shut up so you can say your thing, then you're in deep waters. Then you probably want to put that thing away and just keep listening to what they're actually saying. Because... I used to suck at listening. And if it's one thing that changed is that I'm a lot more, I'm, I'm listening a lot more. Yes, I, um, I think that's, um, that's some really good wisdom um, that a lot of people should be taking into consideration. We have two, two ears and, and one mouth, uh, and that's for a reason. Absolutely. Um, when you feel unfocused, Eric, and, or overwhelmed, which I'm sure you've been doing, um, or you've lost your focus temporarily, what do you do? Do you have any hacks there? So I value sleep and rest very highly. And when I find myself not being focused, I believe that it's most of the time because I'm not rested. So whenever I find myself not Doing, if I'm in front of the computer on my phone and I find myself scrolling something, if that's a new site or if it's Facebook or whatever it is, whenever I catch myself in that behavior, I realize that this is my head not having enough energy and I put my phone away or my computer away and I set an alarm for 20 minutes and I close my eyes. And if I'm in my apartment or a house, then I lay down and I either sleep or I just close my eyes for 20 minutes or as long until I start feeling restless. Because when I feel restless, I usually have energy again. So I used to think that power naps, you had to fall asleep for them to have a meaning. And I realized that's just really not true by just laying down, closing my eyes and resting. And I feel that I'm rebooting. And it's easy to think that if you lay down for 20 minutes, you're wasting 20 minutes of your day but you're probably just replacing the 40 minutes you would have scrolled meaningless things uh, on the internet anyway, or you wouldn't have done anything productive because if you start scrolling, you're usually not in a productive state. So what I'm doing is that I'm trading 40 minutes of scrolling for 20 minutes of closed eyes resting and actually recovering. So I think that putting digital devices away and just resting has been tremendous important for me when I feel uh, unfocused. And I also have the habit of putting my phone in flight mode at eight o'clock in the evening and not doing anything else with my phone or internet after eight o'clock because it helps me sleep. And if I sleep well, I'm, once again, it's so much easier to stay focused. I believe that most focus problems comes from either not enough rest or too many notifications on your phone. So put your phone away. I try to leave it in my bedroom when I'm at home instead of carrying it with me. And sure, I miss a call every now and then and I'm not able to respond to something straight away. But at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter. And it makes so much easier to stay focused on whatever it is that I'm doing because the phone is not telling me, hey, look at me. Hey, look at me. Hey, look at me. Which phones are really good at saying. Yes, it's true. Um, it seems that rest and uh, resting and and being mindful about your your body energy is something that you're very aware of, Eric. What role does meditation have in in your life? I've been trying lots of different meditation techniques, and 
for me, laying down and rest with my eyes closed, if you call it a power nap or you call it something else, I would say that's the best meditation technique for me. Like just lay down and rest. And I think that meditation can be anything. Either you sit on a mountaintop and look into somewhere and you're wearing a monk robe and you try to reach Zen, or it can just be, okay, I want to be good at enjoying the birds sing when I'm outside and I want to be aware of that they're singing. I want to make a habit of often staying to just smell the flowers, especially in the spring. I want to, when I'm taking a shower, I want to feel the hot water on my skin and be that with it. One thing that i am been trying to do now is in Corona times, I want to make washing my hands a very pleasurable experience. So I want to take that extra minute, think about the warm water, smell the soap, and just be there with it. And I think all of these things help me to regain my focus, get back into my body and be there. And if you call it meditation or you call it something else, I don't know, but it, I, I believe that it helps me to enjoy my life more. And I believe it's really good for my sensory experiences of, of everything to kind of get into that moment in, in an easy way without needing to sit and try not to think, which is like a common explanation of what meditation is. And I think meditation can be anything. Uh, and those are the things that I believe are the most helpful for me and also easiest to do because it, it doesn't take much to like, okay, stop and smell flowers every now and then. Try to listen to the birds or actually enjoy washing your hands. It's a really nice experience to have warm water on your hands and soap usually smells really nice. But still, it's something that we either don't do at all, and I'm definitely guilty of that a lot of the time, or we just rush through it to get on with our day and we think about something else. Um, Eric, I think uh, us as a, um, as a so society today, you know, or I think we prioritize busyness. I think we prioritize productivity. And I think it's, it's a great advice, you know. I think that's a great habit that you have when it comes to stopping and smelling the roses, you know, and really enjoying the moment, whether that's just closing your eyes for a few minutes, lying on your bed or sofa, or putting your phone in the bedroom, you know, like you're saying, and enjoying doing the dishes or, or doing something else. Yes. What's the, the most worthwhile investment you made? It could have been in, in money, time, or energy. Something lately that you might think of. <laughs> well, I would also say that how to win friends and influence people comes high up. Uh, it's one of the top investments that I've done. That's some time ago, though. What have I done lately? I'm actually very happy with this Fitbot bit watch that I have. I mean, that's like a hundred bucks or something. And what I'm using it for mainly is once again to track my sleep. So it can show me if I'm sleeping well or if I'm sleeping poorly. And I believe that sleep and what you eat are the two single most important things for how you're going to perform. And for me, I make sleep a top priority. So now I'm aware when I'm not sleeping well and it's like, okay, I need to change something in my life. So for example, when Corona started a couple of months ago, I got really caught up in reading everything about it. And I started doing this mathematical formulas for how this is going to turn out and what kind of problems this would be lead into. And it led to me sleeping very poorly because I thought that the world was going to well, change a lot, which it did because, well, you can't really travel now and stock market crashed and a lot of things happened. And I kind of saw that coming and it stressed the shit out of me. And what I realized then was that, okay, I can't spend this much time reading news. I need to shut off because I'm not sleeping properly. And then my phone actually told me this, like, okay, Eric, you've been sleeping five hours per night here for a while because you're moving around all night and you're not actually getting proper rest. And then I realized, okay, I need to shut off. Now, a few weeks later, everyone knew about 
Corona, all the countries started closing down and realized, okay, there's nothing I can do to change this. I, there's nothing I can tell anyone that's going to add any value to anyone. All I can do right now is to wash my hands, uh, keep social distancing, and that's pretty much it. If I'm doing those things, I'm doing what I can do. So I stopped reading the news completely, and I have barely read the news in the last two months now, so I barely know what's going on with corona. But I'm sleeping like a baby, and part of it is thanks to actually monitoring my sleep and making that my top priority. So if I'm not sleeping, something is bad. And I think sleep is so crucial. That's interesting, Eric. I, um, I've been trying to monitor my sleep as well. Um, and it seems that you're using this device called Fitbit, right? Um, I try something called uh, the Whoop Band, um, which also tracks your, your sleep. I don't know what are the differences with the, with the Fitbit, but it kind of freaked me out because it was blinking with a blue light, you know, around my <laughs> wrist. <laughs> when I was sleeping, so I returned it after a week. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this one blinks a little bit as well. Uh, but I usually sleep with uh, with a blindfold, uh, so it gets really dark. So I don't I don't see the watch if it happens. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, you said diet is also something that is really important for you, Eric. Not only sleeping and resting. Do you have a specific diet that you're following? So one thing that I'm doing almost every day is that I eat uh, a big smoothie or drink a big smoothie uh, that kind of covers a lot of the things that I believe is, is important to get every day. So it's, um, it's raspberries, blueberries, banana, avocado, spinach, broccoli, ginger, turmeric, water, and olive oil. And then there is a lot of like different healthy superfoods, powders like spirulina and cinnamon and yeah, all kinds of different things. And I prepare this. And when I say I, I usually mean my girlfriend because she's a very loving and wonderful person. But I'm going to say I. Uh, <laughs> I. I usually prepare these like three weeks in advance. So I shop off all the fruit, I prepare all the berries and everything. And I turn, put that in a plastic bag in the freezer. And then I mix it with boiling water so it gets to a normal temperature and I drink one of those a day and I replace one meal every day. And that's like a huge smoothie. So it's like a big meal. It's not like a small thing. And I believe that as long as I do that, I can eat more or less anything else. The other meals, I usually eat a vegetarian kind of diet with a lot of vegetables and stuff then as well. But I think it's so much easier to replace one meal. And if you're a person who eats breakfast, I think it's easy just to replace breakfast because most people eat the same breakfast every day. So if you make your breakfast healthy, it's a very easy thing to change because you just need to change one habit. But if you're trying to change to eat more salads in general, for example, eat more vegetables, you need to change every meal that you're eating. And it gets really hard because you don't want to eat the same lunch every day or the same dinner every day. So for me, it started with me starting to have smoothie as a breakfast. Now I rarely eat breakfast, so instead I usually have smoothie for lunch. And then it's just very, it's, it's much more easy to eat healthy when half of everything that I eat get healthy without me thinking about it at all and just having a smoothie that I enjoy eating. I, I love smoothies, Eric. I, I start my day with a smoothie as well. Uh, and I think that's a great way to get a lot of in, a lot of great superfoods inside you, you know. Yeah, and get and I highly recommend to prepare three weeks in advance in each bag in the freezer. It saves me so much time because otherwise it's like a five minute project to make a smoothie or a 10 minute project. And now it's like a 30 second project. I love things that save me time. <laughs> that's a great tip. What are other things, Eric, that you love that are time savers? Uh, other things that at times I love to always whenever I'm having a meeting I'm always the one who suggests the place because then I everyone always says yes I mean if you say should we meet at a restaurant every the first one who suggests something people say yes to so I make a habit of always asking okay let's meet here and I'm always picking something close to where I am <laughs> so I don't need to to travel because uh, it's a hassle to travel across cities and stuff 
So that's one of the like tiny life hacks that I have always suggest the place first. Um, another one, <laughs> another little life hack I'm doing whenever I'm traveling with someone, uh, it doesn't really save time, but it saves space. Uh, I'm always, let's say we're two people. It's usually me and Johanna traveling, my fiance. We always book our seats on the plane separately, uh, like one seat in between. So I'm aisle and she's uh, by the window. And the reason we're doing this is that a lot of the time, no one takes the middle seat. So you get extra space. And whenever someone takes the middle seat, you can always just ask them, hey, do you want to sit in the aisle instead? So we can travel next to each other because no one ever says no to sitting in the aisle instead. <laughs> so it's like a much, much bigger probability of getting three seats instead of two and not being to be cramped. So it doesn't save time, but it saves a lot of energy. And I just love that. <laughs> That's a really cool hack, Eric. I might give that a try. <laughs> Do it. it. It works. I mean, if, if the plane is not fully booked, they, you, they're always booking the middle seats last. So you you, fifty percent of the time at least you get like an extra seat thanks to that. Eric, you have a big heart. Uh, I mean, you're a big philanthropist and you're doing something revolutionary uh, at Great dot com, um, which is a super inspirational company and initiative. Um, where what was the seed of of this philanthrop philanthropic? idea and an area of your heart coming from i'm coming from a very philanthropical oriented family or philanthropical might not be the word, but a very humanistic uh, family my father and my, both my parents have been very involved with like left-wing politics and uh, been doing a lot of like collecting money for different charities and stuff like that and they did that a lot with me growing up and then I went into a very capitalistic, I want to make money, I want to have a Ferrari kind of lifestyle and pushed myself very far to get there. And I completely stepped away from the values that I was brought up with. I, I was very capitalistic when they were definitely not. And I, I found I was pretty lost for those years. I, I didn't really find happiness. And once I got all that money, I didn't really find the joy with it either. And then I started involving myself in different charitable courses. Uh, and I went to Africa to visit a school that I was a part of. And I remember the afternoon of that day, I was sitting to Toshton, the guy who had built that school and arranged everything. And he told me that uh, in this school building, the kids never get beaten. And to me, it's like, it's so obvious that they don't get beaten. But apparently in all other schools there, the kids got beaten up. And I could only imagine what it's like to be going to school and being beaten. And here the kids were safe and the kids were happy. And that kind of shifted my mindset of what money can accomplish. That money is not about buying a Ferrari. Money can be about making kids feel safe. And there is kind of an end to how many Ferraris you can have or how many Rolex watches you can use but there isn't an end to how many kids you can help. So that became like the seed of, okay, how can I make the biggest impact in the world? How can I change things? And I was first involving myself in lots of different charities. And I realized I'm not good at charity. I don't know charity. I'm good at business. And so I wanted to start a business that was very focused about making money because that's what I've been doing and that's what I know. But all that money would be donated away to charitable causes. I don't need money, but I, many people do. Uh, so that was kind of the seed to making this business happen. Like, okay, let's build something that is based on pure capitalistic foundations and like, like any other company, but we're never about making a profit for ourselves. We're about making profits for others. Yeah, very inspirational, Eric. And you're touching on, on happiness and that you were struggling with that. What is happiness for you? I think waking up and feeling inspired and feeling that I have energy, that's like happiness. If I wake up every day, or at least most days, and I feel inspired to get out of bed and I want to get things done and it comes from a joy, like I'm excited to do this. 
then I think that's like long-term happiness. And then you can definitely be sad and angry and all kinds of things during this as well. But if you wake up sad or if you wake up angry, then something is very off unless someone just died or something happened. But if you wake up, the state you're in when you're waking up probably says a lot about where you are in general in life. Um, and I didn't used to feel excited to wake up. I didn't feel that I wanted to get out of bed to do things. And to me, then I wasn't happy. What did you do to change that, Eric? Because a lot of people are in that situation. I mean, I meet a lot of people on, you know, on the surface, they're very successful, but they're dealing with anxiety. Um, they're heartbroken. They are not happy in general. Like, what did you do to shift that so i've been actively doing a lot of things one of them is like being a lot less on social media because i think that comparison is the mother of a lot of suffering and it's impossible not to compare yourself if you are on social media a lot that's just what happens and no one puts up a shitty day on social media so you're never going to look at someone else and feel oh my life is so good today look at how shitty their life is no one does that. Everyone puts up romantic vacations or party drinks or whatever it is. So limit myself to that has been a big part. Uh, sleeping, as we touched upon before, is a big part because a lot of your anxiety or a lot of your energy or all of these things comes from if you're rested or not. Do you give your body time enough to, to heal and, and deal with these things? A lot of it has come from books like How to Win Friends and Influence People in Nonviolent Communication and asking myself, how can I be a better friend? How can I be a better son? How can I be a better fiance? And focusing on actually improving all of those relationships and not just neglecting them. And it's a mixture of all of these things. There isn't like one big fix, but a lot of the things is going to make your life 1% or 10% better. And if you do those, a lot of those things, it's going to stack up and you're going to be able to deal with anxiety or fear or sadness or lack of energy or whatever it is. I believe a lot of time it's just a recipe. I think anyone who is struggling with anxiety, if they start by looking at how much they sleep, how much they, what they eat and how much they exercise, my my best guess is that a lot of the anxiety would go away if they just did the things they knew would work. I mean, everyone knows how to lose weight. Everyone knows how to exercise. Everyone knows how to sleep. But we're, very few of us make it a priority. And I didn't make it a priority when I was working the most. And I struggled as a consequence of it. And it's not easy to make these things a priority, but anyone can do it. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Eric. I think um, it's, a, it's a topic that a lot of people uh, choose not to speak about. And um, I appreciate the honesty, and I'm sure the, the audience would uh, are learning a lot from, from that. Um, you have an amazing podcast. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. So we have a podcast called becominggreat.com which is partly about building this company and everything we do. So like one episode per month or so is about kind of a reality TV show. What is it like to start a company and what's happening? And it can be anything from these are the goals we reached or these are the goals we actually failed to reach. And this is why it happened to, okay, this employee wants to quit. How do we deal with that? And we speak very honestly and openly about these things because I believe it's a learning experience for anyone involved. And we also do very entrepreneurship oriented episodes, like how do you actually make money online? What can you do to become a better leader? We break down different concepts of things that we find very, very meaningful to learn about. And then we do a great mind map about it. And then we turn it into a podcast episode. Uh, and we, we do these like personal development episodes, very focused on like health or social skills or things like that. It's very oriented around these three topics. Uh, 
and I just love doing it. And this is by far the content that I'm putting out online that I'm the most proud of and that I put the most time into. So Instagram, I believe that Instagram is like, you can say hi to someone in a bar. That's like seeing someone's post on Instagram. You know, like interact with it for two seconds and you can get anyone's attention for two seconds. And I believe like a podcast, that's like taking a long walk with someone. That's how you can really get value and also give value. Like if you have a long, meaningful conversation with someone on a long walk, that's going to shift your life. So that's why I'm, I love putting all the effort into podcasting rather than, I still want to do good Instagram content and good content for other platforms, but podcast is where I pour my heart into it. Of course you did a mind map, Eric. <laughs> of course I did a mind map. How, how else? <laughs> yes. Okay. But th- that's, uh, I, I'm, I'm also really enjoying this podcast medium, you know, and I love the metaphor again. You're a metaphor guy, Eric. Uh, you're <laughs> saying, taking a long walk with someone and I, I completely agree while having the audience sort of like a fly just following us uh, yeah. throughout this chat and this conversation. So... Regarding your podcast, do you uh, do you have any favorite episode you recommend uh, us to check out? Yes, I think one of the episodes that would be best suitable for this audience and one of the episodes I'm the most proud of is actually a very recent one. It's called uh, How to Make $1,000 Per Month Online. I think it's number 67 or something like that. And we we break down very easily like, these are the steps that you need to take to first like find your skills like what is it that you are good at and how can you use that to make money online and then how do you develop those skills further to like get to that point where it's actually something you can sell and then how can you get people to start buying this service from you and what steps to take and how other people that i know have done it and i think that's so I believe that if you can start making like $1,000 a month online on a side business or whatever, I think that's enough to have huge impact on your quality of life. Like that's how you can make sure you don't need to worry about a dishwasher breaking or you can don't need to worry about rent or you can travel a little bit whenever. Like if you have this as a kind of side business and you know that money's coming in, I think that's that can be the change of, having to wake up on a Monday morning and being really sad that it's Monday and sitting in rush hour traffic to being able to create the life where you can wake up when you want and never needing to answer to a boss. And this is just about how to make your first $1,000 a month. You can keep doing with the same strategy, the sky's the limit. And it's pretty much what I did when I first started out and it took me very far. Fantastic. That's a, that's some really gr- that's a really great topic that I'm sure a lot of the listeners would be interested in. Um, I hope so. Yes. Eric, where can people find more uh, about you online? Where can they go and say hello to you on social media? I know that you're not a big fan on Instagram, but I know that you have it. Is there anything- I'm very active on Instagram. Uh, okay. yeah, I'm awesome. posting like three times a day on Instagram. So I'm very, very active posting. I'm just not scrolling. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, on on Instagram, my username is smiling Eric, Eric with a K, and I'm very active on Twitter as well uh, with the same username, smiling Eric. And then the podcast becominggreat.com. We have a video version which is on YouTube, and then you can find it on any podcast app, Spotify and iTunes and wherever. And I'm sure there can be links in the description of this episode for everything as well. Awesome. Well, definitely make sure to, to link to those, Eric. Uh, I just had a final question to you. Who will, I mean, we've been interviewing and we've been meeting a lot of really cool and successful people, you know, from all types of walks of life. Who would you like to see on our podcast? So one project that really inspires me is the Ocean Cleanup. It's a charity project that wants to clean the the seas from plastic. And the founder there is called Boyan Slat. I think that that's a very inspirational story that I would love for more people to hear about. He's taking the environmental 
challenges into his own hands and was like, okay, I'm going to dedicate my life to this. And that's a truly inspiring journey. And I'm hoping that a lot of people want to do similar things after hearing about his story. That sounds um, extremely inspirational, Eric. I'll definitely pencil that down uh, and make an outreach to him. Um, it's been awesome to have you here on the show, Eric. I, I really appreciate your valuable time during this tough times uh, when it comes to the corona. And I'm sure our audience has really has appreciated your amazing and inspirational story and I've learned a lot from it. From it. So keep up the amazing work and keep inspiring the world. Um, you're a real legend. So thank you. Thank you for having me, Frederick. Thank you for listening to Fika with Rice. I hope you enjoyed the show. Who do you want to have on our show? Let us know by sending me an email at frederick at absoluteinternship.com. And before you go, if you like this conversation, don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes or Spotify to get to listen to more inspirational stories and life hacks. We'd really appreciate it. See you next time and much gratitude for listening.